everybody. It's Tuesday afternoon, and you know what that means. It's time to talk close of business. Today, we're really excited, as we always are. We can't help ourselves. But today, we've got Bob Cattell. Uh, Bob is from the Institute of Gas Innovation and Technology up at Stony Brook. He's got a, had a long, distinguished uh, energy and power career. We'll talk about that in a little bit more in a minute. But as I think as we all know, universities and research uh, institutes and think tanks are going to play a really important role in what happens to energy and the environment over the next 20 or 30 years. We've been lucky enough to visit with people from Stanford, uh, from UCLA, from Colorado School of Mines, and so we're really excited to get Stony Brook uh, into the discussion. So uh, welcome, Bob. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And Bob, through the miracles of eBay, I was able to find a Sea Wolves Nation, uh, you know, pullover. I have to admit, it's not my size, particularly after I put on the COVID nineteen. But uh, you know, go it looks, Sea Wolves. It looks, it looks good on you. And for those of you oh, who wow. don't know, Sea Wolves—that's the mascot of Stony Brook University. That's Stony Brook Absolutely. University. Absolutely, <laughs> go Sea Wolves. Well, that might be our subject line today when we send this out, Bob. Go Sea Wolves. I got it. So. So let's get uh, warmed up and uh, and tell uh, all of us uh, what's going on so so Bob can do his thing. Mike Bradley, you and I were going back and forth uh, coming into today. In the last week or so, the energy markets have seen the Keystone announcement, the announcement on delaying permits, rejoining Paris. Elon Musk has a $100 million prize for, um, I think it's rocket fuel that is uh, – is, uh, is carbon neutral. New York City pension funds reiterated they want to divest of fossil fuels. There was another Larry Fink letter uh, from BlackRock talking about climate change and, and public stocks. We've got protests going on in Russia. We've had earnings from the big three as we kick off earnings season, and we had a DAPL court ruling today. So you sound like you've probably been bored. Nobody probably wants to talk about any of those things, and you're just so excited. Uh, to come and talk to us about them, at least. Is that is that right, Mike? Well, Maynard, as bad as that all seems, it's hard to believe that energy is still a stop, the top performing sector year to date. Yeah, the Ooh. group, you know, since Biden basically um, it was inaugurated the day before, I looked at it today, the XLE, the XOP, the OH are all down about six and a half to eight percent. But year to date, the XLE, which is the broad energy index, is up uh, roughly 7.5%. The EMP is up 13%. The OIH is up 6%. And the S&P is up 2.5%. Clean energy is up around 13 to 14%. So the last week seems horrible. But guess what? You got to take the long-term view here. Energy is still basically doing well year-to-date. It's the best performing sector. Second thing I'd say is this is that the volumes that we've seen on this news are just really, really low. And so even though the screen is really red, what I would say it's on low volumes. Uh, and so you, you really, I don't think that is really an issue of there's a bunch of sellers out there. I think there's just a lack of buyers is what this market is telling you right now. There's just so much uncertainty. So I look at it from a positive standpoint, a lot of bad news has been thrown at the group, but yet it's still up. And it's not going down a massive volume. So I still think that people are still wanting to play energy for this year. They just have a little uncertainty right now. They still are looking at an inflationary trade. So macro funds want to be there. They just want to get some uncertainty out of the way. So, yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. I mean, I, I come out of this more positive than negative, to be honest with you. What, what do you think most people are thinking if, if uh, surveyed all investors, most people are thinking um, WTI might do this year? given kind of what they've seen so far in, in January? I think what's happening with Biden and all these rules, I don't think really many people are expecting anything's going to happen with that this year. It's going to be more of a 22 issue, but I'd say most people are probably around the current range. I mean, Colin can uh, speak about this, uh, you know, what futures are telling you, but I'd say most people, you know, guys like Goldman and some other shops are looking at $60 plus, uh, at some point this year, but I'd say consensus is probably low fifties. Uh, and I think we're kind of, you know, gearing towards, you know, something in the mid fifties. Uh, so yeah, consensus uh, is low fifties. 
And I would say the equities in general are dialing in probably 46 to $48 crude. So there is some upward bias here. I still, you know, like we said before, these names still have another 30 or 40% upside with good news. And, and with the, you know, even at the current strip, we just need to get some of this uncertainty behind us. And I think we will. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike. That's a good lead in. Colin, you heard that, uh, uh, that laundry list of uh, things going on. I think you were going to help us look at the, uh, commodity markets and see if what, what they're showing based on uh, some of all this exciting news. Yeah, Maynard, I think that's right. If you look at the options markets, it echoes what Mike was saying and basically indicates that traders of futures and options uh, were expecting what we've seen with Keystone, XL, Dakota, um, the uh, moratorium, at least temporary moratorium, possibly longer on uh uh, new leases on federal lands. But if we take a look at this chart, here's the 25 delta skew in prompt TI. Uh, this is implied volatility points. So a negative number means a negative skew or a skew towards the puts. Positive would be towards the calls. It's been negative uh, for quite some time. But a couple of takeaways. The first is you can see heading into the presidential election on November 3rd, there was uh, an increasing concern about the uncertainty of what may or may not happen after the presidential election. And in fact, the low uh, in terms of the put skew was the day of the election, a negative 22 implied volatility points on November 3rd. Once that question was settled, there was actually a very strong movement to the upside, even though traders expected uh, these various policy prescriptions that have now in fact come into existence. Cool. What's interesting and is- also Colin, obviously in there, we got the uh, the vaccine news was in there as well, right? Within a, a week or so of the election. For sure. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that there was some expectation that there would be a vaccine into uh, 2021. So, you know, on some level, you know, this, at least from the options perspective, was more resolution of, of, of some of those questions. In the futures market, um, as opposed to the options market, uh, I think you got more of a response to the vaccine in terms of flat price. But this is just the structure of the risk of upside versus downside. So the way to think about it is they were much more worried about the downside than they were about the upside. And that if something went wrong, it could go really wrong. So there was this interest in buying puts. Uh, when we got to January 5th, we almost you know, busted into a, a territory here where you would have had a bullish tone in, even in the options markets. In other words, uh, getting more excited about the possibility of a $55 price, a $60 price, and so on. Of course, we had the awful events in Washington the next day. You can see that we dropped skew by about seven percentage points uh, to this day, right before the inauguration. And then since the inauguration, we've dropped about two uh, vol points. So in plain English, what this is all saying is that um, the, the traders were not surprised by Keystone, by Dakota, Access, by any of that. And in fact, when we look at the vol surface out through time for the next two years, it really stands out that the area of greatest focus to the downside for the moment is the April 2021 contract, CLJ1, which expires on March 22nd. Uh, you can see that's the highest point here for um, uh, the put skew. And then there's another dip as we get to the end of the year into 2022. And really no interest whatsoever in the calls. If the market were expecting to see some kind of surprise collapse in US production uh, here for the NYMEX WTI crude oil contract, we would expect to see more of a, of a bid for those out of the money calls. Today, there was some call buying in the deferreds, 300 contracts on the D set a strike price of um, 51, uh, 709 in the April of, of 2021 at 53, but really nothing at all that would suggest um, any kind of, of worry on the part of the traders uh, relative to anything other than weather. You can see it a little bit more clearly here looking at the volatility smile. This is prompt TI um, mm -hmm. across the past year. One thing I'd point out is as of today, the volatility smile looks exactly as it did a year ago. It still has this negative put skew, as we mentioned. Um, a year ago, there was greater concern about COVID and some of the emerging signs of weakness on the demand side uh, through industrial, residential, and commercial. This is now more weather, but we're nowhere near the kind of pressure that we saw back in April. And so to finish up, here are heating degree days, uh, gas weighted looking across the past 19 winters. 
Uh, you can see that the peak for the gas weighted curve tends to happen uh, in the third week of January. So we are passing it now. It is um, cold and snowy in New England uh, today. But really, it's just been a very warm winter, uh, another one, second in a row. And if you look down here at the bottom right-hand corner, the middle Atlantic states cumulatively have had about a 16% warmer than normal winter. U.S. is 13% warmer than normal. So that's what's going to be built in here to the, to the front end of the curve. So looking forward, um, if there were to be some call buying, that would definitely be something that would get our attention and would indicate that expectations about the supply demand balance were changing. Okay, that was awesome. So uh, in the spirit of uh, university and education and learning, uh, I'll try to be, I'm a, a student in your class, Colin, a, a put skew uh, quickly, um, um, it's are we getting more puts than we're, than we're getting calls? So that it's skewed to the put side. How is it calculated? Is it like a, a volume? weighted the dollar price of puts versus the dollar price of calls? Like, how are you calculating those numbers on the left side of your axis on, on the first chart? So the first thing you need to look at uh, is something called delta in option speak. And so you need to find an option that is moving a certain percentage relative to a one percentage move in the underlying. And so a number that options traders will often look at is the 25 deltas. So for a one percentage point move in the underlying, that option price will move a quarter of 1%. And so that tells you which strike price to pay attention to. And then the other thing you need to do is you use the Black-Scholes equation to extract the implied volatility that has been attached through trading um, of that option. And of course, you do want to pay attention to liquidity and make sure that this is a reasonably clean indication of a liquid market. That's often why the 25 deltas are preferred over say the 10 deltas, just because there tends to be more activity in those options closer to, um, uh, to the underlying uh, at the money level. So once you have uh, that vol surface as it's called, you can begin to get a sense of that tug and pull between the puts and the calls where you know one could have picked uh, an option that was this distance from uh, the at the money on the call side or could have picked one that was at the money on the downside. And that skew begins to give you a sense of riskiness on how bullish and how bearish uh, a trader is. And the collective wisdom of the crowd has told us they've been very nervous now for more than a year. And uh, in the present instance, uh, more worried about the weather being uh, warmer than normal than being colder than normal. And so uh, kind of last question, if we think back to uh, bull markets when we were all confident oil was going up. So let's say pre-2014, what, what would a put skew tend to look like or a, a, that same chart, call skew, maybe you'd call it, what would it have looked like in a, in a really good market where people think things are going up? Is it a, a quote, call skew? Yeah. I mean, it's basically, it's just always a skew. And when you're in a bullish market, you would tend to get a fly up onto the call side. And really, one of the reasons there's a bit of a bias right now is because uh, very few of the consumers are, are worried at all about, say, a 60 or 70 or $80 price. They're betting correctly, in our view, that if you yeah. were to see temporarily um, a $60 flat price, there's 8 million barrels uh, of, of spare capacity from OPEC that would instantaneously be called upon yeah. uh, through the supply elasticity. And then there's another 2 million barrels in the United States, and then whatever you think Iran and Venezuela could do. So in other words, there is an absence of perhaps, you know, a, a good chunk of the consumers. You may still get investors who are interested in buying uh, those calls, but they're not interested in overpaying for them. So you have to be a little bit careful that you don't fall in love with the Black-Scholes theorem and think that there's, you know, some sort of magic that it gave you, in air quotes, the right number. But it's a useful tool um, if you're attentive to the liquidity and some of the deficiencies of that. To, to give us a sense of greed and fear, as we called it a week or two ago. Fantastic. Well, I, as you said that, Colin, I could tell Mike was already falling in love, but uh, <laughs> I'm teasing you guys. But it is really interesting to see, you know, what we think is happening and what we think sentiment is, and then to dive into the securities or dive into the um, commodities markets and try to try to see what what people are voting, what they believe, uh, you know, when they write a check, so to speak. 
Well, Bob, uh, welcome again. We're really uh, glad to have you. I, uh, I, um, you know, your background is really neat. You're at Stony Brook now, um, there with the um, leading the Institute of Gas Innovation and Technology. Uh, but you were a CEO of Keyspan. Uh, some of us know it as uh, the old Brooklyn Union. So your your career spanned a lot. You're on the National Petroleum Council. Uh, you're part of the National Off Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. So you have a ton of things going on in, in technology and in policy, and you get to see young people and technology uh, startups every day there at Stony Brook. So on behalf of all of us in Sea Wolves Nation, uh, welcome to uh, Close of Business Tuesday. We're glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Maiden. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And Thank you for that very nice brief introduction. That's the best kind. <laughs> it was very interesting me listening to Michael and Colin. Uh, a couple of takeaways for me, Michael. I guess we're going to be using uh, fossil fuels for a little while longer. And and Colin, we, with all of the projections that we make about supply and demand, at the end of the day, weather probably has more of an impact <laughs> on pricing <laughs> than than any of the things sophisticated models we could run. So uh, and and the reason to have a futures market is none of us knows the future. That's the yeah, that, entire that point true. of it. That is very true. We, and we can't predict the weather, even as sophisticated right. as we've gotten. But anyway, but it is a pleasure, pleasure made it for me to be here this evening and to talk to you a little bit about uh, the kind of things that I'm involved in in, in the energy space. And again, uh, starting with my background, you touched on it. I started to work uh, in the energy business right out of college. Uh, I started studying mechanical engineering and I actually have a master's degree in mechanical engineering. I thought I was going to be an engineer my entire life and uh, took some different paths from that. I started actually with a little uh, gas company in Brooklyn. You mentioned it, the Brooklyn Union Gas Company, and we were strictly a gas company. That's all we did. Our whole goal in life was to convert people from oil to gas. And we did a pretty good job of that. And the company in, in the uh, late 1990s, as I was kind of working my way up in the company, uh, we ran out of we ran out of market, believe it or not, in the territory that we served in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. So we looked east. We looked to Long Island, and uh, you heard the way I pronounced Long Island. That's how we say it in this part of the world. Uh, and we we expanded and we acquired properties out on Long Island gas properties. We became Keyspan. We actually formed a holding company. And at that point in my life, as I was eventually moving up to the CEO role. I thought that there was a, a, an interesting business proposition from being from, from the wellhead to the burner tip. I wanted to be in every aspect of what I call the energy value chain. So we started an oil and gas exploration company, an ENP company, and I learned how different the culture is in the ENP world from the utility world. But we did okay. We took that company public at one point and spun it out. We owned pipelines uh, up in, in the U.S. Uh, we owned a, a, a midstream company up in Canada. And in the 1990s, when they told us we were running out of gas in the lower 48, we actually went yeah. up to West. We should come back to that, Bob, because these energy, uh, these uh, we're always sure of a certain thing and somehow it doesn't work out that way. That that was uh, that was a yeah. big one that we thought for a long time. Yeah. Well, we, we were so concerned about running out of gas in the lower 48 that uh, a group of what we then called local distribution companies, went up to Canada. We went to Western Canada, to Alberta. I had never even heard of Alberta before. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you a little story. I was on the plane flying into Alberta. First time I was ever going to Alberta. And I'm sitting there and the pilot gets on the horn and he says, well, the temperature is 28 degrees. And I said to the woman sitting next to me, is that, is that Fahrenheit or Celsius? And she says, doesn't matter. It's damn cold. Well, it was damn cold in Alberta, but we did. We went to Alberta in the 80s, and we actually built a pipeline to bring natural gas from Western Canada into the Northeast, the Iroquois Pipeline. It took us six years to get it approved. It took us a year and a half to build it. So what, what's happened in the interim, of course, and most of this has been through technology, we now find out that we are perhaps the largest producers of oil, of gas, uh, in, in the world. And we've got a reserve base that will last us, who knows, maybe a hundred years. So after spending my uh, entire career in the energy utility business, I uh, retired a company called National Grid, which was a global energy company, acquired Keyspan. 
Uh, they kept me on for a couple of years as U.S. chairman, and then uh, I retired. Well, not really being a good enough golfer to go out and play golf and do stuff like that, I had to find something else to do. So I connected up with the then dean of the engineering school at Stony Brook University. Stony Brook is one of the uh, state universities in New York. Um, there are 64 state universities in New York. Stony Brook is one of the larger ones. And we collaborated and uh, raised money to build an energy research center at Stony Brook University. Uh, that center went into operation about 12 years ago. And as you pointed out, we have in it a center for innovation uh, technology, really looking at and doing research to develop the new technologies that are going to be necessary in the energy field going forward. Can I just ask you? I know there's a there's an engineering uh, you know culture, so it was uh, kind of logical to have that. But at the same time, you know, it's not a big energy. Is not uh, uh, we don't see it as much in the Northeast. Is there anything that drove the university to embrace energy like it did? Yeah, it was interesting you asked that question because when, when I first started having my discussions with the, the dean of the engineering school, uh, we didn't really focus on energy research. We, we were looking at what Stony Brook has always had a big research uh, uh, effort. They've been big in research. They do a lot of medical research. They do research in other fields. But it just turned out around that time, oil hit its high. I think it hit a high of $100 a barrel at one point. So we said, wow, you know, and we were then very dependent on imported oil. Imported oil was really where we were living off. So that's how we came up with the idea about energy research. What could we do to make okay. us more efficient, more less, more less dependent on imported oil and, and more environmentally uh, compatible as well? So those were the driving forces, really. Okay. And the Northeast, as you know, has never had resources uh, indigenous resources in the Northeast. We've always had to import our energy from someplace else. So the, the idea well, was- well, Bob, Bob, we're, we're th they're there. We just, uh, we can't get a, a drill bit in the ground in New York State. <laughs> well, that is also true. That is, a, that's a whole other story. But-, but I know, think, I won't pull you into, no, into no, that but, one. But, but let, me, let me play off of that because if you think about what's changed the energy industry in the U.S. more than anything else, it's the technology of fracking. Fracking has really changed the dynamics. That's why we were able to produce. And I know that in some areas, fracking gets a bad name, but I am a, I'm an engineer and I believe that things can be done safely. They can be done in an environmentally compatible manner. In our state in New York, the politics, and it's really driven by politics, was that uh, we should not do fracking in the state of New York. Um, I don't agree with that, but that's the decision that was made politically. I think it's unfortunate because if you look at upstate New York, uh, the economy is really hurting very badly. Oh, yeah. You look right across the border at, at Pennsylvania, and they're doing really well yeah. because they've created a lot of good jobs. Through, through I have market. my uh, my wife's from upstate New York. And we have a lot of relatives uh, still up there, and um, one of the uh, my nephew took a job at Schlumberger and started driving down to Pennsylvania and making a fantastic uh, salary. And it really uh, it was uh, eye opening for everybody. But uh, but anyway, we won't we won't uh, cry over undrilled wells, Bob. <laughs> no, that, that anyway. won't help us very much. But I think uh, you know, just building on that point a little bit. Um, you know, I started my career in natural gas, and and I see that natural gas will continue. In my opinion, will continue to play a role in our energy future for a long period of time. There's no question that we're moving more towards renewables, and we should. Renewables should play more of a part in our energy mix. But I look at natural gas as kind of being a foundation fuel that will allow us to use more renewables and will take us to the point where perhaps someday, not in my lifetime, because I'm an old guy, uh, will be 100% renewable. Personally, I'm not sure that's ever achievable, 100% renewable. But should we have more, more renewables as part of the NAG mix? Certainly we should. And, and we've got to do things to bring the cost of those renewables down. So the energy center out at Stony Brook is really in the middle of all of that. We're doing research in what I kind of characterize as every aspect of the value chain. We're looking at production. 
We're looking at production of renewable gas. We're looking at production of hydrogen. Hydrogen is very much in the in the limelight these days as being a, a solution to a lot of our problems in the future. And I think that's going to be part of it. We look at we also look at uh, the basic utility business, distribution, transmission, distribution of energy. We look at energy efficiency. What are the things that we could be doing to be using energy more efficient, both both in the distribution and transmission and also in the end use? What are the things, what technologies can be developed to help us be more efficient in the end use uh, end of energy? So those are the things we look at. We also have a very unique uh, relationship with Brookhaven National Labs, which I can mm -hmm. expound on a little bit, but it looked yes. like you, you had Please. a question for me. No, I'm just, I've got the uh, the look of, uh, I'm entertained and intrigued. But yes, please hit on uh, Brookhaven. That sounds, that'll be really fun. Yeah, well, as, as you, you may or may not know, Brookhaven National Labs, it's one of the, I think, 10, maybe 13 uh, national labs that the Department of Energy runs around the country. Uh, you've heard, heard of uh, Lawrence Livermore. There's some others that, that but Brookhaven uh, is in the Northeast. It's located on Long Island. And uh, it's, it's a DOE laboratory, but it's managed by an entity called Brookhaven Associates. Brookhaven Associates is a joint venture between Stony Brook and Battelle. Battelle is another famous laboratory in the country. And they manage the DOE labs, or they manage Brookhaven for the DOE. So because of that, we have a very close working relationship with Brookhaven. And the way I kind of characterize it, uh, Maynard, is Brookhaven does what I call basic research, they're looking inside metal, metals to see how the molecules are moving. We then at Stony Brook take that basic research. And one of the tenets of the energy center when it was developed is we were gonna do research to develop technologies which could be commercialized. So we're mm -hmm. looking at real technologies that can be commercialized and create businesses and jobs. So we have a great relationship with Brookhaven that can do very basic research which then we can translate into things which truly can be commercialized. So that's kind of a, the, the way we look at things. As a mechanical engineer, is there a, a technology that's gotten you particularly excited recently? Something that's come down the pike where you're like, wow, that's just really cool. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think the technology that's evolving the most rapidly, I think there's two things, there's two things. But one is fuel cells. Fuel cells, I think, are coming. Now, for those people who don't know what fuel cells are, Fuel cells are, are devices that can take natural gas, they can take propane, they can take renewable gas, and they create electricity with basically no emissions. So the, the technologies of fuel cells are developing quite rapidly, and I think we're gonna see more of them. The other technology or the other entity that's evolving very quickly is battery storage. Battery storage is really becoming much more economic and it's becoming larger scale. And if you think about renewables incorporated in the energy mix, as we know, the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. So you really need to have battery storage so that you can have the energy when you need it. So the battery storage technology, Colin, is one that seems to me is, is growing at leaps and bounds today. Bob, I was gonna ask you a while before we leave uh, Brookhaven too far behind, uh, you know, the this is just a layman's impression that we used to have such a robust and incredible national lab system. And you worry that maybe we have underinvested lately or maybe things aren't as good as they used to be. And I don't know where I get that, but would you comment yeah. on sort of the, the health of the lab system as you see it through Brookhaven and is everybody excited? And there's a lot of, you know, you know what I'm saying? Well, I do exactly what you're saying. And I think your, your point is well taken. There has been a concern, and, and I guess there's been some of it over the years, that we haven't been spending enough money on research. And not only in energy, you could look at other fields also. You know, I don't want to get into the pandemic. We could talk about that all night. But when you think about a country like the United States, and why weren't we better prepared? Weren't there things that we could have been doing in the, in the medical research, perhaps to put us in a better position? The same thing has happened with energy. There's been less money spent on research over the last probably 10 years uh, than, than had been in the past. Uh, the hope is that uh, in the new administration, with a lot of the focus on energy and renewable energy, 
that more money will be spent on energy research. But there are a lot of demands on the federal government, as you know. So yeah. uh, we hope that that's the case. But it all starts there. you got to have the federal funding because the federal funding supports Brookhaven. It also supports Stony Brook. A lot of the programs mm -hmm. that we take advantage of are federally funded. Well, we'll let you get back on the track, Bob, but uh, yeah. we're obviously going to have a lot of questions, but maybe as you keep taking us on a tour, would you tell us about the uh, the students and the companies that are that you're coming in contact with? I think yeah. one question that is always coming up <clears throat> is young people and their desire to get into energy. Sometimes that's an oil and gas question, but it's a it's an overall question. So we'd yeah. love to hear some more about the students at Stony Brook. Yeah, well, that's that's one of the reasons uh, that I really enjoy being out at Stony Brook. Uh, maybe it kind of keeps me young uh, by interfacing <laughs> with the students, but the students are great. They've got a great, great group of students, very mixed, very diverse population of students, which is a good thing also. And uh, I get the chance to interact with the students. I do a little bit of mentoring of some students. But just uh, just seeing the, the enthusiasm that these young people have for energy. Now, it's a little different when I was growing up because when I was growing up, it was more traditional energy. It was oil and gas. It was traditional steam boilers. That's what mechanical engineers did, learned about when I was going to school about steam boilers. Uh, so today, it's really looking at the new technologies, looking at renewables, looking at battery storage. And these young people are so smart. I mean, they, they ask such good questions. They have such new, ide great ideas. And I think maybe, maybe it's the nature of young people today. They are more entrepreneurial in nature, perhaps, than, than I was growing up. When I was growing up and going to school, my whole goal was to get a job. You know, that was it, get a job. <laughs> and I went, I went the Lord. I remember that feeling. You do, you do. Well, I needed the money, you know, but uh, my family needed the money. Let's put it that way. But I was very much oriented to go to work for a large corporation. You know, in those days, we talked about benefits. You know, we talked about things like pensions. You know, uh, the young people today uh, aren't as as taken up, if that's the right word, as much in those kind of things. They're much more entrepreneurial in nature. And that just is one of the benefits of being at the Energy Center, because we have in the Energy Center about a dozen early stage companies. And that's okay. a little bit what I'll talk about, some of the companies that are being there. And the students at Stony Brook have the ability to work with these early stage companies. So it does two things. It gives them a great experience and what it takes to really put a company together, but also it gives the company the benefit of the wisdom of these young people who are really great. So we have what we call incubator companies at the Energy Center, and those are er truly early stage companies. Let me give you a couple of examples. We, we have a company called Thermalip that has developed a gas-fired heat pump at the Energy Center. Now, what is a heat pump? A heat pump can use natural gas, it can use hydrogen, it can use renewable, and it, does both, it can do both heating and cooling in the same vessel at very high efficiencies and essentially with no emissions. That, that, was, that was developed at the Energy Center. It is now ready to go commercial. They're going to put about 20 units on test in the field this year. And so that's one product that was developed at the Energy Center, which has now become commercial. We have another company in the Energy Center that's working on converting internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. As you probably know, there's a big uh, push to, to go into electric vehicles. And one of the challenges is the cost. And there are a lot of internal combustion engine vehicles still on the road. So this company is developing a, a, an economic system to, to, to uh, convert internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. And they have a contract actually with, with United Parcel Service, UPS, to convert a number of their vehicles. We have another company in the energy center is looking at producing producing energy from wave motion and things of that nature. So those are just just three examples of some of yeah. the companies that are being developed at the Energy Center and the relationship between the the entrepreneurs and the company and the students is a critical one for, for on both sides. So Bob, the the first one you mentioned uh, the the heat pump and uh, no emissions. 
uh, you know, I think that's, uh, of course, if you, if you had to capture what, what everybody's looking for, it's, it's no emissions, uh, either at the point of consumption or through the whole chain. Um, how does that, in the heat pump example, do you know how, how that works? How is it that they can do it without any emissions or what's the thought? Well, the, the, the way it works, it, it really, and, and maybe not to, to digress too much, but this is a technology that was actually developed by Volkswagen in Germany in the 90s. It's an, mm. you know, it's an engine. And they never commercialized it at that time. They, they were building automobiles. They did something else which worked out pretty well for them. But we have a professor who was actually at Volkswagen at the time that brought this technology to, to the U.S., and what, what they've done at the energy center is they've taken the technology and by using the ability of using computers today and being able to use different metals and materials, they've so improved the con con combustion process that you essentially get 100% combustion. And all of the effluent, if you would call it that, that would be going up the stack is now being used internally to, to create the motion and the energy to move this, this engine. So that's why the efficiency is about double what a conventional energy would be, and you wind up essentially with, with no emissions. So it's really, it's, it's the future, because reducing emissions is our future. I mean, that's fantastic. What, what, Bob, do you find um, <clears throat> your students, are, are they mostly that you're talking about here, undergrad or graduate or a mix, or what kind of students are they? It's, it's a mix. It's a mix. Now, these are mostly, in fairness, these are primarily engineering school students because that's mm -hmm. we we're, 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 you know, an energy technology institute, uh, but both undergraduate and graduate. And then we get some, we get some uh, what they call postdocs that come back and work at the energy center. And many of them, it might be their first job. They don't get paid very much, but they get great experience. So it's, it's all of the above, actually. And and you said they're uh, entrepreneurial, and that I mean that sounds so fun. And we agree that's what's so great about the current generation is their um, their confidence and ambition along those lines. Uh, do people literally leave uh, Stony Brook from the institute and go start companies, or do they tend to go to work in um, you know really unique established companies? Where where do they go? It's a mix. It's a mix of all of the above. Uh, there's not too many of them that really go out and start their own company on their own, but many of them will go to early stage startup companies for their first job. Uh, some go the more traditional corporate route. When I say corporate route, they might go to work for a utility. They might go to work for, uh, you know, companies that's in, in the energy space. So it's kind of a mix, really. You know, and, and when you're getting out of school, the most important thing is to get a job. <laughs> so, yeah. so a lot of them will go where the money is, so to speak. But, but it's kind of a mix. So you said one thing, Bob, I was struck by in your lead-in comments. Um, you, you said when you guys were at uh, Keyspan, Brooklyn Union, and, you know, you started Houston Exploration, and that was a, a, a different culture. And, um, and now, so the power culture and the oil and gas culture, those, those always had a certain feel to them. But in today's world, the power companies – are increasingly the companies, you know, doing the renewables, doing the, a lot of the things yep. that, you know, responding to consumer sentiment on yep. things. So they've, it's really been a dramatic change. What, as a former power CEO, yep. what do you make of all this? Well, I, I think, I think it's good. Uh, you know, I think it's good. Uh, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. When, when I was at the Brooklyn Union Gas Company, we were essentially a regulated monopoly. If you wanted to buy gas in the territory that we served, you could only buy it from Brooklyn Union. You didn't have any other alternatives. Now, we, we always try to be a customer-sensitive company. We did a lot in the community. So we try to be a little different, but, but we were a regulated monopoly. In the 90s, uh, as you probably know, uh, the various regulatory agencies started to deregulate. They started with the, with the pipelines. The pipelines became common carriers so other people could transport their gas. And then they deregulated at the distribution company level where customers of Brooklyn Union could buy their natural gas and eventually their electricity from marketing companies. So the utility had to change its culture. It had to become, in my opinion, more customer sensitive because if they wanted to keep those customers. They had to be able to provide the value proposition. 
then as the industry continued to change and we went away from the old utility model to a more distributed model where company where people could now have on-site generation people as i said could buy their their energy their commodity from others the utility culture had to change it had to change to become more customer responsive it had to teach its people to adopt if you think about the old electric utility model you had large generating plants that generated the electricity and it was distributed to the customers and that was the model if you now look at the utility electric utility model you see a lot more on-site generation it started with things like cogeneration so it's a different model so the utilities have to be more innovative they have to be more customer sensitive so the culture has to change and i think it is changing and i think it's for the better hey, hey bob can, can you talk on those lines can you talk about how the utility commissions are changing in this world as well I mean, they've been in a world where it's, you know, they're used to the traditional electricity generation. And, you know, you got you got guys like Nextera and others that are way out in the lead. How are these utility commissions? Uh, are, are they up to speed as well? They tend, oh. you know, are they lagging from a regulatory standpoint? And how do they basically start to um, justify oh. putting this stuff in a rate base that's already been put yeah. in a rate base? <laughs> how, how is the friction on that? That's a very, that's a really, really good question. Uh, and, and, and I think they're trying to change, but I think they're a little behind the curve, to be honest with you. When, when I formed, an, uh, the, I mentioned I formed an, an oil and gas subsidiary in what was then Brooklyn Union, I had, to take it, I had to take it out of the utility. They would not let me keep it in the utility. Now, you might argue that that's, that was a good thing because it's more risky, blah, blah, blah. But any of the profits that I made in that oil and gas utility, uh, the subsidiary, went to my shareholders. Now, that was a good thing for my shareholders, but some of that could have flowed back to the, to the rate payers and helped me keep rates down. So I think the commissions are trying to change, uh, and I think they're going to have to change because in order, in my opinion, again, for the utility model to evolve the way it should evolve and give customers more choices, I think the utilities have to be in some of those businesses, and the utility commissions have to allow them to be in those businesses so the benefit can go to the ratepayers, because the ratepayers are the one that support the utility. Now, if I call them ratepayers, we really should call them customers. Ratepayers is the old terminology <laughs> that we use, but they're customers. Yeah, they got to be treated it's like highly customers. impersonal. Yeah. So, so to answer Bob, your question, I think the commissions have a little ways to go yet to catch up. So, Bob, we uh, I mentioned in the lead-in, we've we had uh, a lot of fun talking to. Um, the Stanford team about their natural gas initiative. We've um, talked with UCLA to a, a good friend in the finance department about ESG. Uh, we talked to the Colorado School of Mines uh, in particular about all the, you know, the rare earths and the other metals that are going to be necessary to, to uh, if we're going to, if we're going to do the renewables in the scale that we're talking about. Curious, do you, do you guys at Stony Brook have interactions with other, academic or research organizations and what what do you feel is is going on out there we the answer to your question we do those are some pretty prestigious organizations that you've made mentioned but no we do uh, one of the things that we we try to do is to collaborate we realize we do not have all the expertise at stony brook so one of the things we do is look for collaboration and most of the collaboration we do is probably pretty close to home we collaborate with, with a lot of the institutions in New York, the Cornells of this world. We collaborate with MIT up in, up in, up in the Boston area, uh, Northeastern University. We have very close collaboration. We're doing a research project right now for the Office of the Naval Research in collaboration with the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. So collaboration is something we pride ourselves on. And when, when you're looking to uh, get federal funding, I think it's almost essential that you have good partners. And some of the some of the institutions you mentioned are some of the best partners you could have. Well, and, and another thought, Bob, that I'd be curious for your views on. Um, I think one of the things we are kind of, sort of, maybe not kind of, sort of, we're absolutely trying to do is to, um, you know, to find ways to improve the energy and environment discussion, so that people attach value to the to the usefulness of both and realize there are some uh as Colin likes to say there's some laws of physics that you can't 
you can't overcome, and there's some right. economic things that matter, and uh, yeah. all these things are a trade-off. Uh, um, do you find that um, in your community that, uh, that, that that there's a how would you say is the is the conversation balanced? Are are we are we talking about nuclear? Are we talking about other options? Or do we realize the good that comes from oil and gas? I think uh, we're just we're trying to create a big soup here, Bob, where everybody stops <laughs> polarizing this discussion. Yeah, unfortunately, I think the the conversation oftentimes is a little bit of polarizing. Uh, you know, the, the terminology I use, I don't think there's any one silver bullet here that's going to solve our energy problems going forward. I think we need to look at all of the above. I think there is a role for nuclear in our future. I certainly believe there's a role for natural gas in our future. I think we're going to be using oil for a long period of time too. But do we need to phase in renewables? Do we need to reduce our carbon footprint? Yes. But I think we got to do it in a reasonable manner and do it in a collaborative fashion. You kind of you alluded to before. It's not us or them. It's not the fossil fuel people against the renewable people. It's the fossil fuel people working with the renewable people to provide a good energy future. One thing we enjoy in this country is a great quality of life. And we have the best yeah. quality of life of any country in the world. If you look at how we got there, it's because we've had energy. We've had relatively cheap energy for a long yeah. period of time. Now, have there been some abuses? Yes, but we can correct those. So I think one of the most important things you can do is create that dialogue. Listen to other points of view. Have some people who are in the wind space come on and tell you about offshore wind. Have some of the people who are doing solar sure. come in and talk about solar. But it's not an either or, in my opinion. It's a collaboration of all of the above to make it really work, maintain our quality of life. And economic economics is important. we got to have jobs. It's talking about creating millions of green jobs. I hope they do. But we got people in the oil patch that need to stay working. We got people doing a lot of things that, that need those jobs. You know, uh, well, Bob, listening to that it reminds me of um, one of our, our guests who reminded us that if you have an hour to, uh, to answer a question, maybe you spend the first 59 minutes asking the right question and then take the, the final minute and, uh, you yeah. know, you can put the, put the answer on the table. I, I think it was Albert Einstein who maybe... <laughs> Uh, came up with that originally, and maybe that's apocryphal. <laughs> I have no idea. But pretty, um, pretty smart you know, guy. I, yeah, <laughs> I feel that you know, as Maynard, Mike, Matt, and I, as we you know, have sort of been on this journey to talk with as many people as possible to have a platform where we welcome people and and say you don't have to agree with us, and you know, we we want to hear from everybody. We just want to have a civil discourse. Yeah. That that's the point that keeps on coming back. Ask the right question ask, specify the right objective. Don't start with the answer, right. which is the problem often. Be open-minded enough to ask a question and then listen to a lot of different uh, answers in that final minute. You know, I think that's absolutely the right approach. That really, that's the way we've got to look at things. And, and I, I, I hope I've added a little bit to that dialogue. <laughs> I think no, you most certainly have. <laughs> you've been great. And the fact that you are... Um, in New York, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, every region has its own views on various things. And this is a, a global thing. So getting your perspective is is really super helpful. Can I just ask you, we should take advantage of the fact that you're very involved with wind and uh, give us some of your thoughts on, on what's happening with wind and what we might see next and what are some of the key right. issues and opportunities. Right. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, I, I currently chair the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. I won't tell you how I got that job, but it's not important. But the purpose of that particular entity, it's funded by the Department of Energy and uh, New York State Energy Research Development, NYSERDA, to do the research, to develop the technologies to bring the cost of wind down. There's a big push, particularly here in the Northeast, to have offshore wind to be a bigger part of our energy mix. So it's coming. But it's got to be done, one, in an economic fashion, and two, it's got to be done in a reliable fashion because the wind does not blow all the time. It actually does blow all the time, but at different velocities. So the purpose of the, of the wind center is to really spend money on research to develop those technologies, which are going to bring the cost of wind down. The other thing we need to do with respect to wind 
is we do not have a supply chain. We do not have a workforce to support an offshore wind industry. So there's a lot of work that has to get done to really make offshore wind a part of our mix. But it is coming. The states have made large commitments to contract for large volumes, kilowatts of offshore wind. Now, it's not without issues, though. You know, where are you going to land the cables? Nobody wants the cables to come on shore in their community. Some people don't like to see the windmills out there 20 miles offshore. Uh, so there are issues that, that have to be addressed. And that's part of, you know, what, what Colin and you were referring to. People have to have a civil dialogue and figure out how do we incorporate this energy resource into the mix in an acceptable manner. Bob, one thing I was thinking in your career, um, I'll probably overstate that, overstate this, but that's my job as the host. Uh, I'm teasing you, but what you've you've seen the country when you first started your career. I'm guessing, you know, it was relatively easy to get a permit to build something, to make yeah. something happen, to you know, to just get it done because there was a recognition that you know, we were growing and jobs and we just had a different yeah. mentality. And today it just seems like, I mean, yes, last week it was sad to see what happened at Keystone, but we've been fighting about that pipeline forever. So yeah. do you have any hope that we can get better at some of this infrastructure, timing, permitting, decision-making stuff? Well, I, I think, you know, your point is well taken. It was a different world when I was growing up. And, and maybe sometimes people took advantage of that. Uh, it's a much different world today. I think we're much more sensitive to the things that need to be done right. Um, I think, you know, to use a, an overly used term, the pendulum has probably swung a little too far to the antis, where it's, you know, don't build anything anywhere, uh, I think is, an, is a need for, for infrastructure to be built. It's got to be done in an environmentally sensitive manner. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm not optimistic, I have to say, but I'm hopeful that, again, that there'll be a, 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 a dialogue that'll be created so that we get the infrastructure built that needs to get built. Well, look, as we, we wrap up, and Mike and Colin may have a closing question, but I, I have one for you. Um, you know, you're doing so much giving back to the community all your years of experience and helping those kids and those companies. What can we do to help you? <laughs> well, that's that's a very nice question. I think what you're doing, I think, is just creating that dialogue. Uh, you know, certainly to the extent that you want to make people aware of, of us up here in the Northeast and Stony Brook University, people are considering going to good schools. It's a good school. If people are interested in learning more about the research that we're doing, we'd welcome when we can have visitors or we could do a Zoom call. So I think yeah. just getting the word, word out about some of the stuff we're doing would be great. Well, and look, all those uh, quality, uh, uh, you know, students that are learning all that stuff about new energy technologies. Uh, now, we don't want to take them from from uh, out of great the great state of New York, but you know, <laughs> we we're interested in that stuff too. So they can they can send their resumes down here. Okay, that's you know, looking for jobs. Jobs are important. <laughs> jobs matter. Job Colin, matter. Mike, anything from you guys as we wrap up? I, I would just say a thank you to Bob to uh, for reminding us how important buildings are, green buildings, and uh, the example of the water pump, because it seems like the light vehicle discussion, the transportation segment just uh, takes a lot of the oxygen out of the room. But of course, you know, residential construction heating, uh, residential commercial heating is so important and also the industrial side. So those pumps and boilers that mechanical engineers have been studying for ages, they're super important. And maybe they're not for everybody to, um, right. to know the nuts and bolts about, but in terms of running our civilization, that is one of the key things we're talking about in trying to optimize. Great, thank you. Well, look, Bob, we really appreciate it and we'd love to help you get connected uh, more around energy country if we can ever do that, but we're gonna uh, try to publicize Seawolf, Seawolves Nation here <laughs> and, uh, Again, just really, really enjoyed visiting with you and, and thank you so much for joining us and what you're doing. Well, made it. thank you for having me and I hope it was informative. And uh, if you ever want me back again, you can try if people could take me once, they maybe could take me twice, but <laughs> thank you very much. Bob, you're stuck with us. Be careful what you <laughs> offer. It was a pleasure. Thanks everybody. It was a pleasure guys. <laughs>